like to extend a special welcome to anyone who may be visiting for the first time or for the first time in a while. Whether you are worshiping here with us in our sanctuary or from the comforts of your own home, whether you are worshiping right now in real time or a little later on in your day, I'd like to remind you that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here in this space. there will be a visual a vigil for sexual assault awareness month that is also in the month of april and our outreach team is going to work to put together a group to attend that vigil together that's six o'clock on april 27th which is a thursday i'll remind you again but just kind of put it in your brain and then on the next day april 28th we will be having our free Friday movie, um, movie yet to be decided, but that would be at seven o'clock across the parking lot in our parish hall. That is also free. I think that that's enough for now. Lots going on, all very good things. Do we have any celebrations this morning? Any celebrations? So in our church, it is tradition to honor the celebrations, and sometimes people like to make a donation. And so we have made it our tradition to spotlight a nonprofit organization to receive these donations. And this month it is a Trenton area Parkinson support group. I'm sure. We'd just like to celebrate three great report cards from our kids. If there are no other celebrations, I invite you all to take a deep breath. Settle back into your and prepare your hearts and minds for worship.
Annie and our call to worship, which can be found in your bulletin. What are you looking for? The light before dawn. What are you looking for? A reason to hope. What are you looking for? Joy after grief and flowers after winter. What are you looking for? A place to belong. What are you looking for? We are looking for the Messiah. The news. Come in. which is the Red Bound Book. teenagers, I often hear, Mom, I can't find my, insert, shoes, backpack, Chromebook, keys, snacks, you name it, it's been lost. After asking 
asking, have you checked your room, your desk, et cetera, I would be ensured that they had, in fact, checked all of those places. And each time, like clockwork, I walk up the stairs into the bedrooms or into the dining room, and like some parental magic trick, pull out the missing item that, of course, has been there the entire time. They just couldn't see them. Family of faith, sometimes our relationship with God can feel a little bit like that. We seek after God. We swear that we're looking, and yet so often we miss when the divine is right underneath our noses. So let us pray together, knowing that our seeking has limits, but God's love does not. Let us pray together our prayer of confession. God of resurrection, we confess, like a dog with a bone, we run aimlessly. We chase our tails, looking for things that provide answers to the suffering of the world, looking for comfort to our longest night. You meet us in the darkness before dawn, but we mistake you for the gardener. Forgive us for seeking after worldly things. Forgive us for forgetting to seek you. Speak to us. Call us by name, that we might recognize you in our midst. With hope and gratitude we pray. Amen. Family of faith, no matter how many times we lose sight of God, God never, ever loses sight of us. We might spend our whole days seeking, but we are always found. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel, the good news proclaimed in resurrection. What once was lost is found. We are held in God's loving embrace, forgiven, claimed and sent to serve. Alleluia. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able, in body or in spirit, and join us in our Easter hymn, which is on an insert in your bulletin, called Who Are You Looking For?
scripture readings this morning. Rabboni, teacher, we have spent the past six weeks asking questions. We have turned over every rock. We have shined a light in every dusty corner. We have opened the blinds. We have wrestled with truth. And we have sought after you. So on this Easter morning, Bring wisdom to our seeking. Move through this room until the walls echo with the sound of Alleluia. Roll back the stones that might prevent us from drawing closer to you. Calm our hearts. Say our names. Awaken us to your presence in our midst. We are here. We are listening. We are seeking after you. Alleluia. Israel sought for rest. The Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again, you shall adorn yourself with your tambourines and go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. Again, you shall plant vineyards on the mountains of St. Maria. The planters shall plant, fruit, plant and shall enjoy the fruit. For there shall be a day when sentinels will call in the hill country of Ephraim. Come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. 
They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Here ends our reading. I invite you to remain seated and join me in singing our hymn of resurrection, number 170, in the Christian praise hymnal, which is the Red Bound Book. <laughs>
relationship with others, ourselves, and with God. We ask the question, what fast do we choose? Who will we listen to? How do we begin again? Will you give me a drink? Can these bones live? And where are you headed? And I think that most of these questions led to more questions and wonderings, not answers. This morning's question for us to ponder is, who are you looking for? It is the question posed to Mary Magdalene in our gospel reading this morning. We know who Mary was looking for. Mary was looking for Jesus. We also know that Jesus was right in front of her. What keeps Mary, and if we're honest, ourselves, from being able to see Jesus in our midst? What is it about finding God that often makes us like teenagers looking for their belongings? In this instance, fear, grief, and doubt keep Mary from seeing Jesus, her teacher, and her friend. I would argue that those very same emotions keep us from finding Jesus. And often, those are the emotions that set us out in search to begin with. In order to better understand how Mary may have missed these signs, I'd like to share with you this story from her point of view. I know you don't know me and you have no reason to believe anything I say, but trust me, if you listen to my story, you won't be disappointed. It might even change your life. I am Mary of Magdala. Most people call me Mary Magdalene. Even though we haven't met before, you may have heard of me at least my reputation. But remember, not all rumors are true. What is true is that I never really was interested in making myself small enough to fit into the limited roles that society thought appropriate for women. I wanted to experience all the things life had to offer. My parents didn't share my view, and they suggested I settle down with a man who they deemed a suitable husband for me, I'm sure he was a good enough guy, but he wasn't what I was looking for. I wasn't even sure what I was looking for when I left home to live my life on my own terms. A financially independent woman is something people don't understand, so I got used to the whispers and the gossip. But what was difficult was not being able to trust anyone. The world was already dangerous enough for a single woman, but one who has some money is a target for all sorts of snakes. Oh, most seem sincere and honorable at the beginning, but eventually their true colors showed. I have been fooled by more than one friend, people I thought loved me, but really, they only loved my wealth. I made the decision to protect myself and what I had worked so hard to accomplish by building walls around my heart. When I cut myself off from this world by not trusting anyone, I didn't realize I was choosing prison. The walls I built kept me safe from any threats to me or my wealth, but this prison also blocked any chance of life-giving relationship or love. You can't have an authentic relationship with money, and now I know. The soul needs relationships to thrive. So my choices made me suffer. People said I was possessed with demons, and I guess I was. I was possessed with the demons of selfishness, a hardened heart and hopelessness. My life wasn't anything like I had imagined it would be. I wasn't living a life on my own terms. I was living a life controlled by greed until I met him. When the man they called Jesus of Nazareth looked into my eyes, it was the very first time it was the first time in a very long time that i let anyone really see into my heart it was like the walls of protection i built around myself were inconsequential to him i can't explain it but when he looked into my eyes i felt seen 
and I could feel something in me start to heal. I realized instantly that he was who I was looking for. I had wasted so much time looking for a life that would bring me meaning and fulfillment. A life I abandoned immediately once I realized that he was the one I had been seeking. He was the one who taught me that no matter how much pleasure and self-indulgence my money could afford me, the life I longed for could never be found by keeping myself at the center. I felt like my past life and my hardened heart were shattered into pieces. But those pieces were slowly being stitched back together in a new way as I followed him, as I learned sitting at his feet, and as I watched him heal people. I watched as he healed them of their isolation. He healed them of their shame, and he offered them new life. I could feel myself being healed too. I could feel the demon of selfishness leave me as I used my money to support his ministry. My money was finally making the world a better place. And my shattered heart healed more when I realized the worth of sharing wealth, not accumulating it, when I stopped building the prison around myself and started building relationships. And when I accepted that true strength is found in vulnerability. It was like I could feel a small bit of warmth in my heart that had been cold for so long. And as that warmth grew and spread throughout me, the demon of hopelessness was banished too. So on Friday, when he was on that cross, and so many of the other followers weren't able to handle the pain of staying with a man who saved us all, I could not leave. I know the pain of a shattered heart, but I couldn't leave him to suffer alone. And when he died, I wanted to die with him. I didn't want to live in a world without his love. I was shattered, but the warmth in my heart was still there. And the love and healing he brought to the world wasn't gone. I knew that even though this beautiful person was gone, we, his followers, would keep his love and justice alive in the world. I was thinking about that as I arrived at the grave early that morning. I wanted, no, I needed, to show his body the respect and care he had shown me. I arrived while it was still dark. I really didn't want any trouble with the authorities. But when I got there, the huge stone blocking the entrance to the tomb was rolled away. I assumed the Romans had declared their final assault on our beloved Jesus to deny him a proper Jewish burial. I ran to tell Peter that they had stolen Jesus' body. I had never seen him respond so quickly before. Before I could even process what was happening, Peter was going to the tomb and John was on his heels. In that moment, I was overcome with grief. I was crying so hard I was unable to go on. They confirmed that all that was left in the tomb were the grave clothes he was swaddled in before being placed inside. Peter and John reacted quickly, returning to tell the other disciples. I just stayed in sadness and weeping. Eventually, I had had enough strength to look into the tomb. I guess I needed to see for myself. I knew no one had gone into the tomb since Peter had left. So when I saw two figures sitting where Jesus' body had been, I couldn't make sense of it. One of them said, woman, why are you weeping? And I just yelled, they've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. In that moment, I just needed to be with the others, with those who shared in my grief. So I turned to leave, but, but the gardener was standing in my way. And he asked again, woman, why are you weeping? Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will take him, I begged. And then he called me by name, Mary. In that moment, my life flashed before my eyes. The time I rejected the husband my parents found for me. Images of my old pleasure-seeking life. 
The moment Jesus first looked into my eyes and everything changed. All the times I was healed by his love. And the moment he took his last breath. But I was sure. I was as sure of this as I have ever been sure of anything in my life. Standing there before me was my friend and my teacher, Jesus. Jesus told me to find you, his followers, and to tell you what I saw. He is going to ascend to be with God, but his time with us is not yet done. He was there standing with me. I have seen our Lord. Not even death can stop what he has started. The world will never again be the same. He is risen. Beloved, when we have been where Mary was, feeling lost and alone, searching for more meaning, more grace, more love, more hope, we have looked around our lives sometimes for just a glimmer of God. We hope that times of longing and seeking God will be few and far between, but we also know that life can be harder than we imagine. The earth can be unjust and cruel. Bad things all the time happen to good people, and no one, no matter how hard we may try, is free from grief. But that isn't the end of the story. From time to time in our lives, we might find ourselves seeking God. But we are an Easter people. Every day, every hour, every moment, God is seeking us. God is calling out to us, just like Jesus called out to Mary. When it comes to the love of God, we are not the seekers. We are the found.
In this economic climate, fear is the greatest obstacle to generosity. Fear that there isn't enough to go around. That if we give away what we have, we won't have enough to meet our own needs. Fear is like a big stone standing between us and the resurrection miracle. So who will roll away the stone? We will, through the gifts that we give today. We invite you today to make a financial gift by leaving it in the basket on the table behind the last pew. You may also make a gift by mailing a check to P.O. Box 216 or by donating online on our website, www.goshenchurch.com. I invite you to remain seated and join me in the singing of our doxology.
May the truth of this day remind you of otherwise. The God you seek will meet you in the garden on your hardest days. And that same God has saved a seat for you at this table. So come. Come whether you are dancing for joy or like Mary, still feeling a loss. Come with your questions. Come with your hunger. Come whether this is your first time or your hundredth. Come because this feast is a reminder that God's table is big enough for us all. Jesus Christ is risen today and he rose for you. So come, all are welcome. Resurrecting God, Mary went to the garden looking for you. Two thousand years later we follow in her footsteps. We seek after you, hungry for a darling moment where we might hear you say our name or feel you in our midst. So before the hallelujahs begin, we empty our pockets of our prayers and remember where we've been. With gratitude, we recall Monday, Thursday. We are grateful for the table we gather around, for the friends that feel like family, and for this church, which acts as our band of disciples. We hold on to the reminder of you washing the disciples' feet that night and trust that that same love extends to us. With sorrow, we recall Good Friday. We grieve the death of cruelty woven into that day, a cruelty so many in this hurting world know. So for those who are still caught in grief and loss, for those whose days have turned to night, relieve them of their suffering. Find them in the crowd. Wipe their tears. Hold their grief for them and point them toward peace. Now with the hope we enter into this feast of mourning to find ourselves face to face with your good news. Thank you for giving us reason to hope. Thank you for the sunrise after a long night, for the healing of bones and hearts, for laughter that is contagious, and for joy felt in community. Tether every gratitude and joy in our life back to you. And now as we come to the table just as Mary came to the tomb, we ask that in every stage of our seeking, you would be near to us. Pour out a double portion of your spirit on this bread and cup, that we may see you as truly as Mary did. And may this meal nourish us to build your kingdom here on earth. Until that promised day, we pray together using the words you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus gathered once more with his friends and followers. After they had finished eating supper, Jesus took the bread and broke it, saying, This is my body, which will be broken for you. After that, he took the cup, gave thanks to God, and blessed it, and passed it around to those at the table, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for you. As we take part in this feast this morning, let us remember this and do it in remembrance of him. Our bread this morning is gluten-free, and our cup is grape juice. In just a moment, I will invite you to come forward, beginning with the choir and moving up that side of the church and around. So hopefully we don't have a traffic jam. I'd ask that you please hold on to your elements until all have been served so that we can partake and eat meals together. If you are unable or uncomfortable coming forward to receive communion, I am happy to come to you. After those who have come forward are seated, I'll take a glance up there, give a little wave, and I'm more than happy to bring it to you if that is what you are more comfortable doing. This is an open table. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all things are now ready.
He looked for you in the mirror, in strangers, in sunrises, on mountaintops. He looked for you in the laughter of children and in meals shared together. He looked for you on the city streets, in the hospital rooms, in jail cells. He looked for you in poetry and hymn melodies. He looked for you everywhere. Sometimes the seeking is hard, but then the other times we come to this table and all are fed, and all are welcome, and there is room for everyone, and no one is turned away or made to feel unworthy. And in those moments, we see you clearly. 
Seek out the hungry. Seek out the weary. Seek the good in every person you pass. Seek out the hopeful. Seek God in each of us. As you seek and as you wonder, may you find what you are looking for. In the name of our loving God, who is always seeking us. Go in peace. Amen.